this is going to be really uh, a useful and inform, uh, informative panel um, for you all today. Um, and it's really something that um, when you get out of side of DC, uh, much like I was talking about this morning, that really drives our advocacy work. Because working with your legislators back home, whether they be uh, members of Congress, um, if you guys could stop your conversation, sorry, I just want to get moving. I hate to be militant. But <laughs> I just want to move forward. Um, but working with either your members of Congress um, or state legislators or even local officials, um, whether they be um, city council members or school board members, um, we've got two panelists here today that are the cream of the crop um, of our advocacy efforts and have um, a lot of experience in doing this. Um, the first is Melody Seeger, um, who is from the um, mid or greater mid-Missouri chapter of AFSP, and Vic Ojakian from the greater San Francisco Bay Area. Both have, <laughs> you've already got a fan, awesome. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to them first, Melody um, and then Vic, um, to just share a little bit about themselves. Um, to give you a little bit of background um, on how they became involved with AFSP and what their experience is with AFSP and how they're going to contribute to this panel, and then we'll move on from there. Um, my name is Melody Seeger, as he said. I'm the Greater Mid Missouri Chapter Chair. Um, I started about six years ago. I wanted to um, get involved with AFSP. I lost my mom to suicide at the age of 16. I struggled for a very long time with trying to find my people, as we so kindly say here um, at AFSP. Um, so I looked online and I found the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention and it talked about the out of the darkness walk and I said, you know, I can do that. I can start a walk in my community. I wanna start the conversation somewhere. What a better place to start a conversation than with a walk? So we had our first walk and um, Janice Hurtado, said, Melody, why don't you come to the first advocacy forum? And I thought, advocacy and politics? That's not for me. I am way too outspoken for politics. And I work for the state of Missouri anyway. This is not going to work. So I said, but I'll, I'll come. I'll, I'll keep an open mind. I'll come to the first advocacy day. Well, I came to the first advocacy day, and I was so excited when I got done. I was so empowered. There was a guy that brought a book, and I don't, I don't know if Trevor knows the man's name, but he had a book called The One Hour Advocate, and he said it only takes one hour, a month, a day, a week, you can give it as much time as you need, but when you go into the office, you need to say, I'll be back. I'll be back, I'm gonna keep talking about this issue, and I'm not gonna go away until we fix it. So that's, that's where I started, was with the first advocacy day, and then I took that back home, and I started growing my chapter, and then I started growing my advocacy in Missouri. So that's how I got started. I think that means I'm next up. So, so let me do this real quick, because I've given a lot of talks over the years because of being a public figure. Um, a few years ago, I had to give a talk to a group of people. It was the third day of a three-day conference. It was first thing in the morning before folks' coffee kicked in. <laughs> Probably have that situation now. <laughs> it, and here's, what I, here's the question. We, because we don't have a lot of time, I won't ask people, um, what I did then was ask people to respond to my question. But the question was this. I said, what's the most precious thing you possess? And I asked people to give their answers. And essentially their answers were along the lines of, you know, my family members, all the things you probably, probably most of you were thinking of right now. My answer was back to them was the most precious thing I think I possess is my life. Because without it, I can't do anything. And if you think about it, it's why we do the work that we do. Because, you know, my son, which I'll get into in a minute, um, he, he can't do things for himself anymore. That's over with. So just quickly, about me. I served in office two terms um, as a city council member and as a mayor. I served in a city <laughs> that's very difficult to serve in. It sits in the middle of Silicon Valley. I live with a lot of, as, as one council member used to say, he said, looking out at the audience like this, he said, probably 50% of you know more than what I know, and in fact, 60% of you do, because it's a highly educated community. And as I brought up with my 
congresswoman yesterday when we were all running around doing those talks and this is the first time I had this happen, a buzzer went off in her room and she said, I have to leave because that's the signal to go sit in on a session. And, and she said, you know, so we got maybe two minutes. And she talked about um, HR 2646 with me because I had met her in her office and asked her to sponsor that bill, which she has done. She told me, and this is the reason why I'm bringing this up, a lot of congressional members uh, on her side of the house um, chastised her. They said, why are you doing that? And she's sponsoring the bill because my wife and I basically asked her to do that. So I told her, and this is to bring home something about where I served, I told her, don't let this become the Palo Alto process. What that means is, in my city, everything's debated. And things take a long time to happen, if they happen. So separate from, you know, you get a little idea of what I did. I served at the local level. I'm a little different from the prior politicians that you, um, that we heard speak earlier. Um, my son took his life in 2004. I was still in office. And, and I think the outcome of that was, of course, I was shocked. Um, but I got doubly shocked when I found out from half the people I knew in the community what they had gone through. So people I know for 20 and 30 years started telling me about what, what had happened to them. So I'm partly here today because I'm gonna try and give you some things, um, hopefully in this short period of time, and if I'm not able to do all that, um, feel free to talk with me offline because we're here you know, through the duration of the day. I always find myself working on three different things at the same time, and if there's time, I'll explain some of those. So I'll use one quickly now. Anybody heard of My3 app? <laughs> of course, some of our Californians have. So for the rest of you, you should look that up. It was, it's owned now by Dr. Draper's group, who we heard speak the other day, the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, I think, has it, but that was developed by a group of a team in my county that I work with, and that app provides you with, on your phone, three little buttons that you put in the three closest people that you're willing to speak with if you're in a crisis. So even if you're in a difficult situation and you're not thinking clearly, you pull out the app and you hit the button. It's, so we're, what we tried to do is make it simple for people who are dealing with a crisis. Um, and then it's got a safety plan built into the backside of it so that if you want to put down all the things that people put in a safety plan, you can do that. Um, maybe I should stop there, Trevor, and at some stage I'll explain to people some of the things I did and maybe how they can do the same things. Absolutely, and I think, Mel, if, if you want to start by um, telling the group, again, as your experience with the greater uh, in Missouri chapter, um, what some of the steps you've taken to interact with legislators, So if you're a new chapter or you're just starting with this, I think it's important to say that you can start out small. You don't have to think huge. You can start out small. Start with your local government. Um, one of the things that I did is I first reached out to our mayor in Fulton, and I said, you know what? Um, I really want to do something. I want to do something for our community. I want to bring awareness. And it doesn't have to be huge. And he said, how about a proclamation? And I said, what will a proclamation do? He said, let me publicly say that in the, in the city of Fulton, that for the month of September will be Suicide Prevention Awareness Month. And let me encourage individuals in our community to seek help if they need it. I said, great. So we did that on a public scheme. He and I did it at a city, we, we signed the proclamation, he signed the proclamation at a city council meeting. We invited the media to come and we did that in front of the media. It gained a lot of attention in our small town and so we started there. And then um, he and I had open conversations um, with the Suicide Prevention Co Coalition in um, Fulton about how we as a community could work together to better open up conversations in our community about suicide prevention, such as town hall meetings and things like that. So then I thought, well, what, what can I do bigger? I want to go bigger. And so um, we went to the state level. And, um, one of the needs that were in our state is we did not have a suicide prevention education bill. So three years ago, 
maybe four years ago. I went to the state capitol and I said, we need a suicide prevention education bill in Missouri. And I simply went to the capitol one day, I really didn't have appointments, and I went door to door. Crazy, I know, but that is what I did, literally. <laughs> And so I went into my legislator's office, I went into Jeannie Reynolds' office, and I sat down, and I said, you know, and she was a teacher at a local school, actually a school that I had went to, and was my teacher at one point. And I said, uh, Ms. Riddle, I want to pass a suicide prevention bill in Missouri. And she said, Melody, we don't talk about suicide in Missouri. I said, oh, but we do. And she said, oh, but we don't. And I said, but we do. And she said, well, we're not ready in Missouri to mandate that someone to get educated in suicide prevention. I said, well, you will be, I promise you. <laughs> and so we had that conversation and we kind of kind of had my, the door shut in my face. And I was very upset and I thought, you know, I'm gonna prove her wrong because for many reasons I wanted to prove her wrong. <laughs> but that was, that was one, I just wanted to show her that we could talk about suicide prevention in Missouri. So, the next year, um, I met a group, and it doesn't. It, it's important to say that we do not have to always. Um, I know that we always like to to take the lead in things, but sometimes a collaborative effort is a wonderful thing. And so there was a group called Avery's Angels Foundation in St. Louis, Missouri, by the name a man named by the name of Rick Cantor lost his daughter to suicide, and he wanted to do something in his daughter's memory. He had a connection to a senator in Missouri named Senator Jill Shoup. Senator Jill Shoup wrote a suicide prevention education bill, but they didn't have other organizations at that point besides his organization to reach out. So um, Rick Cantor reached, reached out to me and said, Ms. Seeger, I, we wrote this bill. Could you read it? What do you think about it? So I referred to the national policy team, actually. I took it to Trevor. I took it to Nicole, and I said, hey, could you help me out with this? I am not a politician. I don't know the ins and outs of what's a great bill and what's not. So help me out, make me understand what this bill says and what it's gonna do for my state. So Trevor and Nicole looked at it. We had a conference call and they said, you could support this. It's not a mandate, it's a recommendation and it has a sound school policy. Ideally, you know, we always want a stronger bill, but in our state set, unfortunately, something with great big strong wordings and mandates wasn't gonna pass. So we took that bill and um, the first year we went through the whole process and due to the right to work out in our state, it fell on the house floor. That's what happened, it fell. So the next year we came back more vigilant than ever. Um, Rick Cantor and I discussed all year long strategy, what we were gonna do, like how are we gonna get this bill passed? Like we, we need to do something. So Jill in the background had already worked with the House side with um, Representative um, Jeannie Lauer, and they had sister bills. So we now have a bill in the House, and we have the bill in the Senate in Missouri. So we have two suicide prevention bills. Well, unfortunately, what had happened in our state the year before is we lost our state uh, auditor to suicide. So as you can imagine, everybody stood up and took notice that suicide was a real medical issue in Missouri. So they were ready to talk about it, and we were ready to help them talk about it. So um, with that, we had two, was it, no, we had more than two. We had the two suicide prevention bills that were a house and a sister, and then we had the Jason Flat Act that was also running around the house, and then we had a Higher Education Mental Health Suicide Prevention Act, and then we had <laughs> a, um, two bills that designated um, the month of September as a suicide prevention month, and then designated May as Mental Health Awareness Month, and we had multiple suicide prevention mental health awareness bills that were on both sides of the House and the Senate. So at that point, um, we submitted, um, we, I started collaborating with the greater, um, the Eastern St. Louis chapter and our Kansas City chapter. One of the things that I can say is, if you can collaborate with multiple chapters in your states, if you have multiple chapters, you, you know, it's not a competitive thing, we're a team. And I firmly believe that in Missouri, we collaborate on lots of different projects. <laughs> and um, one, because I'm a new chapter, we're a growing chapter, and we wanna be successful for the longevity. We want to be the leading organization in Missouri that they come to when they want to talk about suicide prevention, education, and resources. So we, we really collaborate um, in our state about that. And so we um, teamed up, advocated, um, testified multiple times in the House and the Senate and different committees 
And luckily at the end of this session, we were able to pass our suicide prevention bill, which interestingly enough, it didn't pass on its own like we hoped it would. It did get attached to an anti-bullying bill, which we didn't advocate for, but our bill did pass, and that's all that mattered at that point. So I guess my takeaways from that experience, I know I kind of rambled on there, but my takeaways from that experience is start small, build your chapter, build your relationships. And I can tell you that relationship building is key. So those first visits when I told you I had all those doors slammed in my face, I went back and I went back and I went back and I went back. So I can tell you that I got lots of blisters on my feet. I met lots of senators and, or senators and representatives in my state that maybe I, that I didn't personally um, have a vote for. They were more than just my three or four senators in my state. I can tell you that I hand shook and talked to probably 50 to 60 to 70 politicians in the Capitol. And I went back every time that I was in the Capitol and I just went door to door and said, are you the health liaison? Or can I have a brief five minutes with the senator and congressman in our, in your office. And so they would, if they had time, I would talk to them. If not, I would leave my business card. I would follow up with emails. All of those things are important because do not think that this one visit in Washington, D.C. is going to um, be enough to continue the conversation in your state or that they're not, that this is going to be, that that's all that we, is needed. We need follow up. We need follow through. And um, I can say in the last five years, um, one of the things that I learned this week is I've been coming to this for five years. Um, congressman Jason Smith um, is, he's not my congressman, he's um, further south, but I have met with his health LA for five years now, and every year he's wanted to tell me something. I couldn't figure out what it was he wanted to tell me. And so yesterday, as I'm talking to him, he says, you know, I just have to tell you something. And I said, okay, what do you have to tell me? He says, I want to tell you that I lost my brother to suicide. And that the work that you do means something to me. Don't think that because you're not his constituent that I don't talk about you here. And so I just want to bring that point up. Like continue to follow up, continue to tell your story, continue to be a part of your health. The health liaisons are an important part of what makes this hill work. So make sure that you follow up and follow through um, because that's the way we get bills passed. It's interesting. Um, I used to have this saying when people said, how could you serve in office? You know, how could you take that sort of beating? And I, and I had a saying till I read something that Thomas Jefferson said that said it better than I did. What Thomas Jefferson said about the legislative process is, be persistent, um, be, let's see, be persistent um, in, in terms of persevering and be passionate. So things don't happen immediately, they take time to have happen. Um, I'm gonna talk about something a little different, I think in the legislative, or in terms of getting something done, because my mindset has always been this, what is it I'm gonna do to save a life? And so it's not what action gets completed, it's will that action save a life? And so clearly it's important to get federal and state legislation passed, and that's what we've talked about a lot since we've been here. But those aren't the only two entities that you can work in to get something done. So, and the idea is when you think about other entities, I always use this mindset, it's who's making the decision for that institution or entity? What's the decision-making process? And who, who are the leaders? Um, you will see in governmental situations, though it doesn't get verbalized a lot, People will gravitate to certain people who they consider experts in that area. We even saw it the other night with Senators Cassidy and Murphy, where Senator Cassidy sort of looked over to Murphy and said, he's, you know, he's sort of the lead guy on this. He's our local expert. So let me tell you a few things that I've done. Maybe they'll be helpful for you back home in your areas. And I've got a list so long, um, I won't go through all of it. 
but I'll tell you how we started. My son died while he was in college, and we decided we would do something about that because we looked at his college and said, you know, frankly, their services are very poor. And not only are they poor, what we found out is they had cut their budget in the mental health area eight years consecutively. So, um, and I'll do some of these in a very summarized way. It, and this will get you something about the time frame too. Um, over a four year period of time, we went through all of California's public college systems, college and university systems. There's three of them and it equals up to about three million students. So it's, um, you know, it's a big imprint in a way to be very effective in your state. And we went through each of them and we asked them to form um, a student mental health committee and do something about mental health and suicide prevention. All three of them ended up doing that. Um, it took some work and some cajoling, but, but that happened. There the decision makers were, um, Oh, and let me mention this too. When you start to talk at the local level about things, somebody like me is important to talk to. I went through all the things that the speakers um, earlier today were talking about. But remember, especially in most of this country, we have term limits. So somebody like me is in office for a period of time and gone, but the staff isn't. They're there forever. So if you're developing relationships, you want to develop them with somebody like me, but you also want to develop them with your city manager, or your school superintendent, or, you know, and I can go down the list, but you get the idea. So it's whatever institution you're going to work with and who's going to be there for the long term besides who are the, the most immediate decision makers. So we went through the, the California colleges, um, and at some stage we spoke in front of each of the governing bodies, and we identified who it was that we should try and single out and make as a champion for what we were doing. And the way we did that is we and it's been brought up a number of times in the last few days, just got brought up again, find out who's gone through this experience, frankly, who's had to deal with mental health or suicide in their families, because those people are gonna be your champions. Um, we, we along the way um, said, and it's what people talked about, you should have a well-defined script, um, you should know what you're talking about, you should um, make sure that you have data, if you don't know where to get data, um, we, we have a federal database, Whiskers, where you can get some of that information in your state. California has a database, the Epi Center, and so you can get detailed information, but have your data together, and then also think out in front because, and I heard it this morning, somebody's gonna say, look, all of you, I could point at each one of you and say, look, I understand your personal story, and I sympathize with you, I understand what you're talking about and you've articulated yourself well. I really would like to do something about this, but I don't have funding. So try and think about how you're gonna deal with the funding issue up front. Um, we went through, in my county, I went through, <laughs> it's sort of funny hearing somebody talk earlier, we have 32 school districts in my county. It's a decent sized county. And uh, six of them, for whatever reason, already had a school suicide prevention policy. We went through the other 26, and, and to date, 29 of the 32 have suicide prevention policies. Um, we, um, but it's not just the policy. In California, at least, they call procedures administrative regulations, and you want to get those put in place. So AFSP has a document about how to do a policy. It's a little more towards the procedural line. Um, if anybody's interested in policy, just contact me and I can tell you how to put one together. Um, but we went through and, and did that. Um, in the meantime, a group parallel to me in my city um, put together a document. It's called the Comprehensive Suicide Prevention Toolkit for Schools. So it takes some of the two, the two main national documents that are out there, and if anybody's familiar with the Youth Suicide Guidelines out of the University of South Florida, incorporates all those into a working document. So if you went into your search engine and just put in Comprehensive Suicide Prevention Toolkit for Schools, you'll find it. Or you can go under the HERD Alliance, and you will find it, H-E-A-R-D. Um, besides going through the, the schools, um, the colleges, and the um, 
public schools, and by the way, as some people in this room know, um, you always then try and ramp your work up. So what did we do? We didn't have to go through and get a vote from somebody. We went to the California superintendent of schools and through a committee that two of us in this room are on, um, at one stage we said, look, we'd like you to um, ask all the superintendents in the state of California to um, put in, California has a law that requires folks to have what's called, or school districts to have what's called a comprehensive safety plan, school safety plan. So we got the superintendent to send a message out at one stage saying to the schools, um, please, um, in your next iteration, which they have to update each year, put in something on mental health and suicide prevention. When we got the school policy work done, he sent a similar letter out across the state that said, we'd like all of you to adopt a suicide prevention policy. And by the way, here's a, you know, here's a template, an example of it. Um, other things you can do, um, in our state, so this is another thing where you don't have to go through this drawn out legislative process, um, look for certifying boards. So in our state, California has a um, teacher credentialing board. Um, they have put in place um, requirements now over the last couple of years requiring all the administrators, um, school administrators to have, be educated on mental health um, and they've, they're in the process, I don't know if we're done with it yet, we were close, getting all the teachers to do that. Um, I've worked with um, police chiefs, meaning you don't have to, <laughs> there's no elective process there, you just work with a police chief in a community where they've lost folks to suicide. In our area, there's 15 jurisdictions, we've gotten three of them so far to adopt city suicide prevention policies. But working with the police chiefs, you also have to work with their data because each community is different. I'm sure if I talk with all of you, all, each of you would have a different scenario and a different situation, and you have to sort of be flexible and adapt to that. Oh, one other thing I want to make sure that people know. So there are two actions that we were able to do with our county medical examiner coroner's office. And any of you, I think, can do the same. Some of them will be resistant, but some will be cooperative. One was um, through their boss. They asked me to sit down with them. And some, of, some medical examiners and coroners will send out a, a note to the families after a person has died. They try and be helpful with that. Um, why they asked me to look at it is the note was too generic. It sort of covered all deaths. And so we um, shaped one into a... Um, for those that involve suicides. The, when I did that, by the way, and any of you can do this, um, I sent a note out to a couple of mothers that I know who lost children to suicide. And essentially I said, I don't wanna cause you any harm, so don't do this if you don't want to. But if you're willing, look this message over and, and tell me if it, if it fits with if you got it. Would it be helpful? Um, the other thing we've got from our coroner's office, because most of you know, data is always in arrears. Two years in arrears, sometimes maybe even greater than that. Um, our county coroner provides us with redacted case reports of all suicides. Um, we average about 150 in my county. So we're able to put that together. We're able to shape programs around what's going on right now. Um, and he does it in a way that it doesn't violate anybody's privacy. You know, we know, we know some of the factors about age and um, location, cities that people live in and so on and so forth, but not getting into who they are. If I was sitting in my county and let's say Trevor had a, a friend or a loved one that had passed away, I wouldn't know the name of that person. I just know what some of the data is. So one last thing I'll quickly bring up because there's a bunch of things obviously that I've done. Um, in my community, one of the uh, groups of individuals who take their lives um, at a, in significant numbers or greater numbers maybe than other categories, and it's interesting what happened recently, is the LGBTQ community. 
and I don't, <laughs> I don't want to know people's political stand on that, but, and, and I frankly, I try to be value free. I just try and save lives. So um, I asked my county, because of some things that we do, if they were gonna start up a mental health peer support group for the LGBTQ community, because we had done that with some of our other racial and ethnic groups, because we're a highly diversified county. Um, when they didn't, they seemed reluctant on that, and I didn't take that wrong. I think it's just, it adds to your workload, and separate from any of the other judgments that people wanna put at, is somebody's not gonna do something that you've tried to work with them to do, do it yourself. <laughs> so what I did was I found some people in the county that um, work, in, work with the LGBTQ, and um, I, basically I asked for them to get me a room, and I got a room, and I sent out invitations to a bunch of people, including our county folks, and I said, if you'd like to show up, show up. But if you don't, it doesn't matter because I'm going to get something done. So you're not always going to, it's what Melody was talking about, this long, some of the times it's a long drawn out process and you meet with resistance. But if somebody doesn't want to do something, do it yourself. Now what happened was the county jumped on board. They said, no, 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 we'll have it in our room. <laughs> and, um, and they've gotten a, they put a budget line item in our last budget to pay for the ongoing uh, peer support for our LGBTQ community. So um, hopefully some of that's helpful um, to you without going through all the rest, while also saying I think what AFSP does in Legislative Day is very important. Um, all these things, none, is, none should be singled out or, or made lesser. They're all pieces in a puzzle. They all work together if you want to make your community safe. So hopefully, Trevor, I've gone over enough of, enough of these things. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Mel. Hey, guys, I want to uh, try to bring it back to um, just for the purpose of the panel um, on working with elected officials. And I think um, Melody and Vic both gave you um, good ideas, um, not only um, on how to work and their experience with elected officials, but also other people that may not be elected but are also no less equally important. Um, that you're going to have to work with in different agencies. Um, you've heard, and there's been a common theme developing, um, and for those of you especially that have been with us for um, a few years now, um, that you got to treat your elected officials like um, you're their boss. And you are. Um, you elected them. Even if you don't agree with them, you're their constituent. Um, but they also do put their pants on one leg at a time. <laughs> um, some of them think they don't. <laughs> so, some of them think they just wake up with them on. Um, but that goes to, you know, and I'll just be candid. Um, some of these people can be very egotistical. But you have to be kind. Um, especially... Um, and trust me, I've been doing this for over a decade now. I'm not always happy with a meeting that I have. Um, I might want to go home and bang my head into the wall. That's never gotten me anywhere um, if you treat these people with disrespect. Um, treat them as a friend and a colleague. And I think what's getting lost um, in our politics is the ability to have a conversation. You might not agree with somebody, they might not agree with you, but tell them what you have to say. Tell them honestly. Tell them with kindness and understand that it's not a 100% chance that you're going to get everything you want out of one conversation. It's an ongoing, and as we always tell you, relationship building process. You got to make a friend. I mean, I think back to, you know, high school, some people didn't like me. I kept talking to them. It was all right. Um, they still might not like me. I don't know, but it's, I, I'm, I'm, I moved away. Um, <laughs> I did it the easy way. I just got out of there. Um, so, uh, but but really, really approach it that way. Um, you got to obviously convey your message. Um, the tips of the trade. You know, Vic is a mayor. Um, Melody is an advocate for so long. You heard Tina and Steve earlier today. Um, 
and I think Steve um, Elison said something that, and I love hockey, so I got to bring this up. Um, and it was a Wayne Gretzky quote for those of you that didn't pick it up. Um, you do miss 100% of the shots you don't take. You miss 100% of the opportunities you don't talk about. You have to talk. You got to converse with people. Don't be scared. Um, but again, approach it like you would with anything in your workplace or personal life. You want something, you're, you're asking about it, um, but come with short messages, especially with elected officials. Um, and to Vic's point as well, um, and certainly Melody knows this all too well, um, you, you're not always talking with the elected official. You're talking with staff. Um, and find out how to get in touch with them too. Um, so for members of Congress, for instance, you can look at their website, pull it up. You have district office information. Um, you know, it still astounds me um, when people come to town and say, hey, you know, all these, or when they don't come to town, they're just giving me a phone call and yelling at me because something didn't get done, um, which I have no control over. Um, hey, why hasn't Congress done this yet? What, what's going on? Like, aren't they here? Like, isn't that their job? It is, but they're only here two and a half days a week. Um, and quite honestly, they're home 75% of the time. They're back in your districts. Find out how to reach out to them. They have their district office locations and phone numbers listed. It's a great way to get in touch with them. Quite honestly, um, as advocates that you know, come here once a year for an advocacy forum or fly in, um, that's your opportune time to get in touch with them, especially in an election year. Um, every two years, members of the House run. Every six years, a member of the Senate runs in your state. Um, and we have a presidential election going on this year. That's your time. They're in your districts. They're back home. Get them then. Don't let them run. Um, and keep in touch with their staff, because their staff is home too. Um, obviously, we work with the federal staff, and we want you to communicate with them. Um, but we make it easy for you to reach out and get a message across and let them know that they do indeed have constituents back home that care about an issue. Um, but when you work with these officials, they 100% of the time when we ask the question, hey, what's most effective? Is it getting 100,000 emails from some spam bot somewhere? No. It's knowing that they have two, three, four, five, six constituents back home with a real face and an experience and knowing what they want done about a particular issue and what you can boil down in a page or a paragraph in something really short. Um, because they hear from people all the time. It's, you know, and to put a face on suicide prevention, obviously that's our issue and mental health issues. Um, understand that, and, I, and I've been there, um, you know, you feel like your issue is the only one that matters. But again, that's why you don't get angry if you don't get a response. You gotta be persistent to Melody's <laughs> points. Um, you gotta keep going back. You might get the door shut in your face. Keep going back, you gotta do that. But they're getting hit up with people um, that want something done about cancer, that want something done about domestic violence, heart disease, juvenile diabetes. Whatever the cause or case may be, you're, you're not the only ones in the room. So, sure, absolutely. So let me put it in perspective, or let me help you out. Um, and I'm not a cruel guy, but let me explain. We had, we had a process in the city I was in where we decided to carve out some money and we were gonna give it to various social services or, or different you know, um, efforts that were going on. We did that because we figured we wouldn't have to run that operation in our city, it wouldn't be part of our city government and we could leverage our dollars against an agency's matching dollars, and they could also raise funds in other ways, you know, by um, holding events or uh, running campaigns or, or whatnot or asking for donors. And, you know, so then we also, of course, you know, to be honest with you, um, we avoided the tax issue, you know, the big T word that a lot of people don't like um, with government. So it was a good way to leverage our money I don't remember the exact, I remember the exact dollars that we gave out. I don't remember the exact number of applicants that we funded. But we funded, let's just say we funded 10 applicants for a variety of services. We probably got 100 applications. So you get the idea? 
nine people, 90 people, for every one application, nine people were out in the cold and one got, got the money. It wasn't to say that the nine or the 90 were bad people or doing terrible things. So how do we select those people? The way that we selected them is, and it's been brought up by Trevor and, and uh, other folks during this conference, the way we select them is somebody came in and they had a clear, crisp message. We knew exactly what they wanted to do. We thought we could measure it and see that it was effective, and we thought that they were gonna use the dollars wisely. So that, it, again, did it mean the other 90 were bad folks or doing terrible things or you know, their causes were lesser? No, it just said you had to pick. <laughs> Whether you liked it or not, you had to pick a small group of those applicants. So make sure that you have your messages clear. Make sure you know who you're speaking to. It's always a good thing. Um, I, have a, I have a saying that some of you are probably familiar with, fight the fights you think you can fight and win. So we once had a group come in, I guess I won't say who, you know, it was interesting what they wanted. And, and they said, you know, they were passionate about it. Oh, the Thomas Jefferson sayings are persistent, patient, and passionate. They had all those qualities, but they were asking to do something that was clearly not gonna, it wasn't popular. It wasn't going to happen. And I, I suggested to them, in California we have the initiative process so anybody can put something on a ballot. I suggested to them not to do that. They were picking the wrong election and they hadn't done enough groundwork and, and this goes to our work, they hadn't gained enough support from various other groups in a coalition so that they look like a strong entity. They went ahead and put their thing on the ballot anyway and, and they got 11% of the vote. <laughs> Meaning not only did they lose overwhelmingly, they've never brought their issue back again. So um, go in prepared and know what you're doing. Now one, one quick thing so that, because you people are working at the local level, when you go in, um, understand, you want to talk with a council member or a mayor, whoever it is, superintendent, you know, a, a school board member, you're gonna ask them to put something on the agenda. And, and hopefully they do that, and you give them your information so it helps them put their report together for everybody. So then there's gonna be a public hearing. And at least in most states that I'm familiar with, there are open meeting laws so that they have to hold a public hearing and let you speak. So when you go in to speak, be prepared. You bring in a, a group of people to help support it. You wanna present an image that says that your issue is um, not only important, most people want it to happen. Um, if you don't get a public hearing, what I did with some of the school districts when they didn't want it, um, you know, and again, I don't want to be negative, but most superintendents will probably say, hey, you, you know, I appreciate what you're talking about, but my schedule's too busy. So what you do is you say thanks, and then you send them a follow-up message, which is what I did, and, and I copied the school board chair on it, because remember I said before, that person's the decision maker, and I said, I'll be at your next meeting, and I'm going to speak during public comments, which is also open to you. So if somebody doesn't want to give you a hearing, you make your own hearing, <laughs> and you bring some people in to help you out. Thanks, Vic. Um, we've got 15 minutes left, so I do want to open it. Um, Melody, do you have any final thoughts, or? Yeah, I just want to say, because um, we're all advocates, and I know some of you guys are new, is just be persistent in, in your ask. Um, follow up, follow up, follow up. I can't tell you enough. Um, and I wasn't even at an appointment um, for our elected officials, and some of our advocates from in Missouri came back and said, oh, by the way, Christine Ragnar said hi. And I'm like, oh, okay. So, I mean, that, that, value, that shows value in building relationships, because that tells you that I have followed up. I did send the e emails that were requested by the public policy team. So when you get those call, call to actions, you know, follow up with them, do them. Um, that's how you build those relationships. Make phone calls when something is happening in your community that you're... Uh, legislator or Congress um, woman may not know about. You know, especially if a family is affected by suicide, let them know that in their communities, we're still losing loved ones every day to suicide. You know, one of the things that I brought up is we lost in last year was 10 teenagers and two of the counties that I serve in my district 
uh, in my chapter to suicide in a matter of a nine month period. Those schools were less than 35 miles apart. So that shows the big impact on a rural community and a small town. So let them know, because they don't always know. They're in Washington, they're traveling back and forth, they don't know always what's going on in the community, they need us to let them know. And so that's building relationships, and that's also telling them that these bills are important and what we're asking for back home is important. Um, the other thing is when you plan your state capital day, use that as a time to build relationships, especially if it's your first one. Don't go in there with a ton of ass. Just make it a, you know, it doesn't have to be grand. Mine was not grand this year. It was small. But we visited all 238 legislators. It was pretty grand. I'm sorry. It was, <laughs> it was, a, good, it was a good event. Yeah, 238 um, legislators with 14 people. So by the end of the day, we were tired. <laughs> I can just say, but everybody got a folder. We shook hands with every one of them. We told them who we were why we were there, and what, what we wanted. And we left them a folder with all the information. So that, that's important. So when you're planning your state advocacy days, it can be simple. It can be as simple as you showing up with your little packet of information, with some bills that are going through the house that you're, you may not have even testified for, them, and that's OK. You can get involved in that in the future. But start advocating there. It doesn't have to be on a grand scheme of things. Start small and grow your state advocacy days. Don't be scared to start an advocacy day in your state. Thanks, Mel. So I've got a couple of good questions here um, that we'll dive into. And then also just to, again, reiterate, um, the most important thing, you've got to stay in touch with folks and find out how to reach them. Um, the local info, again, I mean, I think when we hear from advocates, hey, you know, I want to do something about um, suicide prevention training or... Um, medical personnel training or whatever the local issue or the um, issue of the day may be, um, you got to know how to reach out to. That, that's advocacy 101. Um, and I think more and more of our folks need to um, get more plugged into the local side of things. Um, know who your school board is. Um, know who your mayor is. Know who the city council people are. Um, because I know, um, and this is its not our fault, it's just how the program has been designed, um, we tend to steer things towards federal policy. Um, but 90% of the action, if not more than that, is happening at the state and local level. So please keep that in mind um, when you reach out um, or when you get out of here today. Um, and then also um, know that our policy team here, whether it's myself, Nicole, Liz, John, um, any one of our more than capable interns, um, if you are having issues um, looking up somebody or finding somebody to contact, um, we know sometimes, especially at the local level, they might not even have full-time staff and they might be hard to reach. Reach out to us so that we can, you know, you're all working. We, we know you've got family lives, you're, you're busy. Um, let us plug away at that um, and find out who to contact. Um, so somebody wrote in, um, I have been told that making something a mandate will not pass, um, but we currently have a non-mandate law for teacher education that no one follows since there is no bite to it. How do you negotiate that loophole? <laughs> do you want me to handle that one, or you? No, Go ahead. Well, I'll start. I'll start, and then I'll see if Trevor agrees with me. So um, we, again, we passed a bill that it was no band-aid. It's a recommendation, but it does require that every um, school district have a strong po school policy that deals with postvention, intervention, and prevention. They must post that on their DESE website, on their school website, and it has to be research and evidence-based, such as our model school policy that AFSP has done. So they can use that policy to create their school policy for their school. Now, I will tell you that when Jill passed this bill, we had many discussions, and Trevor knows this and Nicole as well, I had lots of discussions with them about how can we get stronger wording? Because we had no, um, no law on the books at this point. And she said, if we go in with strong mandates, we won't get the bills. So this was what I told her. So if you pass a bill right now that says recommendations, in four years or three years, when schools aren't putting this law into use, can we go back and ask for a stronger wording and mandates? So she assured me, if we don't see results with this bill, that we will write a re new one. So I think it's about relationship building again. When you're talking about advocacy, build that relationship with that senator or congressman that's helping you pass that bill and ask them straightforward if they say it won't pass mandates right now. If 
it's not working in my state, what are you going to do to fix it and go from there? No, that's, that's, that's great advice. And I, and I think when it comes to mandates um, in particular, obviously it depends on um, what your state political climate might be. Um, certainly teacher training does come to mind, um, I think, um, with, with Mel gave a great example. Um, that's spot on. Um, think outside the box. Um, it's not just elected officials. Who are the union groups or the trade associations that you're going to have to work with? Um, certainly in states, I mean, they're, they're the ones generally pushing back and also, again, like I said before, they're also working with legislators, okay? So you're not the only one in the room, again, trying to push for what you're trying to do. Reach out to those groups, form some kind of a relationship, um, work with them to try to get on the same page. Um, and if you are looking for a mandate, and we are, certainly around school suicide prevention training, um, <clears throat> Think about it like I'm thinking about mental health reform. We're not going to get 100% of what we want. And that stinks. Don't get me wrong. I want 110% of what we want. But if you get a little bit, politics isn't everything. Again, we, we got to get out of that mindset. You're not, you're not going to get what you want. We're not a greedy little kid here. Um, don't act like it. Um, work with them. Get what you can. Um, move forward. And then keep the fight going. Um, <clears throat> next question. Somebody did ask, what does a city suicide prevention policy look like and what is included? I don't know if you can answer that succinctly and quickly. Um, that sounds like a mouthful, but I'll um, give it to you. And if somebody <clears throat> wants a copy of one, I've written two or three different ones for different cities, so I'd be happy to send them off through. Trevor, you, you want to put something in about um, education, um, something in education and training, um, something about... Um, having you know something available for people you know a contact number how people can get a hold of somebody if they're in distress um, you want to put something in on funding um, city manager in one of the cities I work with in the middle of this last deep recession did an interesting thing I put in something about funding if available he changed it to funding when available meaning they didn't have the money now but when it was you know when the economy changed he was going to provide for funding. You want to put something in about an iteration process, meaning you, it's a living document. You want to look at it again periodically um, and maybe something shaped around what's going on in your own community. So that's just quick off the top of my head. Um, that's great, Vic. And I think if you could share an example, actually, I would love to share I, a copy with I, other folks. And that's something for one. us to think about. That's great. Um, this is an awesome question um, and one I think that's very great um, for the discussion we're having. When we go to town hall meetings, how do we effectively bring our issue to the discussion? Um, you can stand up and yell and point. Uh, and sometimes that's effective, although I would not encourage it. Um, here's a real trick, actually, or tip. Um, and, and these are becoming more popular. More people are holding town hall meetings. Although, I'll be honest, again, I'm not sure how long it's going to last because people are standing up and pointing and yelling. <laughs> it's, it's not good. Look to the front or back of the room. When you see the elected official come in, there's going to be staff there. Find the staffer. Go right at them. Tell them your point and what you want to bring up. If it's valid and it's, again, succinct and something their boss can handle, you'll get an opportunity. Now, if it's one of those town halls where it's just they're calling on hands and it's just luck of the draw, that's fine. But it'll help. Um, that's certainly, if you walk into that room and you know who you're, if their staffer is there, um, they will make sure that if you have a question, it'll get to their boss and you'll get called on for a town hall meeting. That's, that's just a tip or trick. Um, also, some of those town halls, I mean, they flow based on um, discussion topics, you know, uh, and elected officials deal with, again, 800 different issues. If they're talking about the economy, don't be surprised if you're standing up saying, hey, I want to talk about suicide prevention, what are you going to do about it? They're, they're, they're talking about the economy, it's not pertinent. Um, so yeah, I mean, make sure to, uh, you know, if they're talking about health care, things like that, um, you know, ju jump in at that point. That, that's going to be your most opportune time. But that, that staff trick is really the key. Because if you can get to them, they'll get to their boss, um, particularly before an event starts, because they'll know it's coming. 
and it'll be very helpful and they'll be prepared um, to answer the question. On the, on the town, on the town hall, hall meetings, one of the things that I've done is sent letters before the town hall meeting to the people that I knew that were gonna be there. So they knew that I was coming, they knew what my issue was, they knew what I was gonna say, so they were prepared to hear from me. And, and again, that goes back to building relationships as, as an advocate in your community. So in, a, you know, in, your, in your cities, your city hall council members, sending letters, letting them know, um, you know that this is what's important in our community, this is why it's important, and this is what we can do to fix whatever the issue is that you're currently addressing at the town hall meeting. And then be respectful of the time of, of the town hall meeting and those that are around you. Um, if you go in yelling and screaming, people are not going to hear you. If you go in there kind and respectful and you speak with class, people will listen. And that is my biggest advice. Anywhere that you go, even in testimony, the Senate, be respectful of your senators and congressmen, be respectful of the people that are standing, sitting in front of you, and speak with class and speak with um, intent. I was gonna bring up two quick points. One minute. Yep, two quick points. Um, I found this out in our state, which is a large state, but I imagine it happens in any, any state. There's a variety of people who work on mental health and suicide prevention. We have too much fragmentation meaning try and create coalitions and uh, work together with other folks, um, whether it's getting the suicide coordinator from the VA hospital or you know, working with the local um, county uh, private per mental health providers or so on and so forth. I won't go through all those. So, but work on putting, because frankly, there's strength in numbers. Um, when people see, we used to call it when I was in office, counting heads to be crass about it. Um, so there's big strength in numbers and, and you should work with other folks. Try and work with people who aren't like you. So I work with a guy, we might be polar opposites, we don't talk about it a lot. Um, why do we work together? We both lost children and both from the same college. Um, and we really complement each other in the way we do things. We're, you know, we're from different parties and so on and so forth. I won't go through all that. But it, it's far more effective because you've got the spectrum. And if one person doesn't want to listen to you because you're not quite one elected person because you're not quite like them, they'll listen to the person next to you. Thanks, Vic and Melody. Um, there was one last question that came in, um, and I'll be totally candid with you. I can't read your handwriting. Um, <laughs> if you put a little frowny emoji on the um, question card, um, come up and talk to me afterwards and tell me what you were trying to ask. Um, and I'll answer it for you, okay? Um, that's it for today. Um, have a good one here.